you know, if somebody said their name to you, uh, you know, hi, I'm AJ, and I repeated back to you, oh, hello, AJ, how are you? And I shook hands with you. Yeah, oh, how do you spell AJ? Okay. We, I've done four things there. I've done the seeing because I'm... Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show where we learn from the people who have followed your passion to achieve great success and have impacted many lives. If you're new here, then please do consider subscribing to this channel. This episode is being recorded in association with Let's Localize, the organization with a mission to foster micro contributions from communities and businesses to support schools for their need of time, skill and money. To know more about them, click on the link above or the link in the description section below. I'm your host Ajay Mathur and my guest today is an author, an educator, an entrepreneur and a globally sought after speaker. He's known to convey the business ideas using simple sketches. He's also the author of The Art of Business Communication, the book that has been shortlisted by CMI as a management book of the year. His second book about the speaker's coach has actually been a winner in the personal development space, personal development category from the Business Book Award. His TEDx speech about why people believe they cannot draw has been viewed nearly 33 million times and it is one of the most watched uh, TEDx speech. He's not just a multiple TEDx speaker, but he also trained other speakers to come on TED stages. So please welcome. The man who is an expert in explaining any ideas using simple sketches, Graham Shaw. Graham, welcome to the show. Hi, AJ. Thank you very much for inviting me. What, what a build up that was. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just say a little bit of what you have really achieved. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for coming on the show. I wanted to ask you, first of all, we all grew up reading a lot of cartoon books, watching Cartoon Network. But I don't know anybody who has got this idea to use cartoons in such a creative way and take it to this level. What is your inspiration? Well, I, I was inspired early on uh, to draw cartoons um, just by watching television. Um, in, in the UK, there was a program um, called Vision On with a man called Tony Hart. And he used to get children drawing. And uh, I remember when I was about 11, I, I drew a picture and uh, he put it on the television screen. So he inspired me a lot. And I loved to read comics when I was a little boy and copy all the drawings, like Dennis the Menace and people like that. And, um, you know, I just thought it was wonderful how um, you could express ideas through drawing. So from a little boy, I was drawing on the fruit in the fridge, <laughs> uh, drawing on the eggs, and <laughs> making them into little faces. So I've always been interested in, in drawing. So when was your epiphany, like, you know what, you can use drawing in so many different creative ways, like conveying business ideas. When did you realize that? Well, um, yeah, the, the main time that happened, I mean, I was a primary school teacher originally, AJ, and I used to use drawing in schools. I would take assembly and I would be sitting on the stage with the old overhead projector. I don't know if people would know what an overhead projector is, but it had acetate on it. And you could wind this acetate along and you could sketch on the acetate and it would show the picture on the screen behind you. Okay. Oh. So it's like a clear piece of plastic and you could draw on it in colors. And I used to help um, tell stories in assembly for the children and um, uh, to make the story come to life. But much later when I was working, I worked at British Airways as a, a, a trainer in corporate training. And I found that those skills that I developed were helpful if I wanted to, to explain a business model. Um, and then subsequently, one day, probably about 15 or 20 years ago, somebody was watching me run an NLP training, you know, neuro linguistic programming, some people might know. And she said to me, could I come and train her trainers, her NLP trainers, to, to draw on flip charts? And that was the first time I created Spike, that little character, because I thought, how could I teach people to draw cartoons? And I thought, I know, if I could move their hand around the page myself, they would draw a cartoon. I thought, well, I can't do that. But if I came up with a little character that was easy to draw, then they would be convinced. So I created that, and I kept using it in my 
training called Cartooning for Trainers, which I ran in businesses, and people really liked it. So eventually, when I was asked to do the first TEDx talk at Hull, and they said, make it the talk of your life, you know, I thought, what can I do? And uh, I thought, I know, I'll teach people to do the drawing, because I knew that they, I'd found a way to unlock their talent with that little sketch. Mm, and you, you, make, you make it look like so simple, because uh, when, we, when I was a kid, I had this uh, subject drawing, and that was like the worst subject. I, I didn't know how to draw, because I once drew a lamb, and I showed it to my friends, and they said, yeah, that's a very nice horse. So, <laughs> yeah, and then I was like, you know what, let it uh, stay here in the subject and I'm not going to pursue it. But you have taken it to a really, really long way and it's, it's helping quite a lot of people. Well, I, I think the key, AJ, what I do is I don't teach people to draw like Michelangelo, you know, but I do believe that people can draw to a great extent. And I also believe it's a talent that many people don't think they have. You know, people say in their mind, I can't draw, I can't sing, I can't spell, you know, all sorts of beliefs we have. So my objective really was not to give people comprehensive drawing teaching, but to give them something that when they drew Spike, the first character that I created, they realized they could actually draw something that looked pretty good. And actually when they learned that little sequence to draw him, they'd actually learned a strategy that would enable them to draw hundreds and thousands of other cartoons. Because if they could draw that one, they could do little variations and do more. So my objective really was to get people confident, to get their mindset changed, to think, well, perhaps I could learn. Mm -hmm. uh, and to do some uh, attractive drawings that, that look good. And, and once they've got that belief, I know many people then have pursued it further. Uh, so, w w what is his vision learning? Vision learning, my company? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I named the company Vision Learning in 1995. And it turns out that a lot of what I teach is to do with vision and visuals. But it was just a name I came up with, really. Um, but the training uh, in, in the company Vision Learning includes things like speaking skills I teach, but also how we can sketch ideas to make them memorable. Uh, and I coach people to speak. So the drawing is just one part of it, but much of what I do is visual. So the word vision worked quite well, I think. So it's just the name for my company. Okay, all right. Uh, maybe you can copyright that vision learning as a way of teaching people by using the cartoons. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it is, uh, we, we, we know that humans are visual people. So we ret retain information longer when we see something rather than when we read it. Yes, but uh, drawing something is a one level above visual. Yes, is there, is there any particular research that has been done that uh, drawing is even better than seeing pictures? Well, there is. I mean, there's the University of Waterloo in Canada conducted a piece of research that was around 2015, 16, something like that, uh, 15, I think. And what they did was they, they looked at the power of drawing to help people remember. And one of the experiments they did, they gave people lists of words to remember, and they gave them a certain time to remember the list. And what they did was they allocated 40 seconds per word um, for people to remember that word and move on to the next. And what happened was some people were asked to simply write down the words, but other people were asked to draw the words. So for example, balloon, um, somebody might just draw a circle and a piece of string below. And then what happened, they were given a distraction task, something totally different, and then a surprise memory test. What they found was that when people had drawn the pictures, on average, they remembered double the amount of words, double, compared with people who hadn't drawn. And so you're probably wondering, well, why is that? Okay, so admittedly it was just a list of words, but why did they remember more? And one of the reasons, and I'm not a neuroscientist, AJ, so I'm not a total expert in this, but one of the reasons that they came up with was the act of drawing um, creates stronger memory traces in the brain. Because when people have to look at a concept or an idea and draw it, they have to do a number of processes. 
So they have to firstly look, you look at the word balloon and then you have to imagine something in your mind. You have to what they call elaborate, there's elaboration. Then you have to do something, you're drawing. So there's a kinesthetic movement. So you're drawing with your hand and then eventually you see it. So you're doing more than just looking at it. In fact, it was better than simply looking at pictures. Yeah, I think that uh, resonates with uh, a, a proverb in saying somebody said that I, when I read, I remember for some time. When I see, I remember even longer. When I do, I remember it forever or something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And my big tip for children and students with learning is I say, you know, there is evidence, and I don't know how, how, whether the exact figure is right, but people say, we often remember about 20% of what we read. Now, that might be more on a good day, less on a bad day. Okay, but we do forget a lot of what we read. Yeah. It's just words. But if we translate that words into pictures, okay, and we do several things with it, when we see, if we see, there's four things that we need to do to really boost the memory, okay? If we see it, okay, and we hear it, and at the same time we say it, and we do something. See, hear, say, do can boost your memory up to more like 90% of the information, okay? So seeing, hearing, saying, doing. And that's why I encourage students to be able to sketch little symbols and pictures. And incidentally, they found at the University of Waterloo in Canada, it didn't matter if the drawings weren't very good, right? So somebody drawing a, what you might describe inverted commas as a very poor drawing, um, it didn't make any difference. It could be a little stick figure or something. The brain still got it. So, but remembering anything, if we use more seeing, hearing, saying, doing, it makes it more memorable. I'll give you an example. Um, many people aren't good at remembering names. Mm -hmm. Okay. When they're introduced in a, in a room at a business meeting or a party or something, someone says the name and it goes straight past them. One way to remember it, and these days with COVID and certainly in some cultures, of course, we're not allowed to shake hands. Okay. But in, in, when we were, you know, if somebody said their name to you, uh, you know, hi, I'm AJ, and I repeated back to you, oh, hello, AJ, how are you? And I shook hands with you. Yeah, oh, how do you spell AJ? Okay, we, I've done four things there. I've done the seeing because I look at you. I've done the hearing because I've heard your name. I've said the name back to you, and we've done something because I've shake, shaken hands. That's four things, okay. And I've made it even more memorable by asking you a question about it. So, oh, how do you spell that? That's an unusual name, AJ. Is it just AJ or is it a word? By the time you've done that, you've done something with the information, you've processed it. And that's rather like the University of Waterloo with the elaboration. And you know, if you do a bit of work, it will help your brain to remember. But if you just listen, it just whizzes past. Yeah, so you touch it as many senses as possible to retain the information for much longer. Touching the senses is good. You know, children learn visually, they learn auditorily, they learn kinesthetically through feeling, and the more we do more of that, the better, really, AJ. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so in, in your book, The Art of Business Communications, what are the key points that you um, tell people how, how you can use the drawings for business communication? Okay, well, the key, the key point there is, uh, AJ, how you can take a concept and think in pictures and translate it into a picture. So, for example, we might have, um, I'm just seeing if I've got a pen here, to come prepared. Uh, oh, I've got some pens over here. Hang on. Oh, some pens at the back. So, for example, uh, communicating ideas. Here we go. So, you know, we might have, um, one of the things I teach, if, can you see this? Yep. Yes, okay. Yes, yes. So we might have something like, if I did a, a, a really simple picture here of a tree, can you see that? Yes. No. Okay. So now I, I would say to you, well, we know what could the tree mean? Okay. Uh, nature, growth, something like that. Yep. Nature, growth. I'm just writing them down. Climate change. Climate change. Or uh, uh, prosperity, maybe. Prosperity, prosperity, all those sorts of things. So can you see I've written them down? Yeah. Like not, not, not very neatly, mm -hmm. but the point is that when you can draw a simple symbol, it can mean many different things. Mm -hmm. You know, so we can think of a concept 
and create a picture to go with it. So for example, I might think of um, achievement. So I might think, oh, I know, I could draw somebody uh, at the top of a, can you see this? Yes, yes. Somebody at the top of a mountain, there he is, <laughs> Wave, waving a flag. Okay, and I could talk about uh, achievement, write that word, or, or we could talk about goal. That could be a word for goal, where we want to get. And in business, you could explain this by creating a story or a metaphor. For example, I could say, oh, this is where we are at the moment. We are here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're, we're down here. Okay. And where we want to get to is up here. And we're going to look at, you know, what are the different steps that we're going to need to take to get there? What are the hurdles? So that's just one example of where, you know, we can begin to discuss something in a picture, like a project or, or something, by sketching these ideas. So once we can do that, then um, we can explain things in pictures. We know that, um, for example, with problem solving, you could have a whiteboard or a virtual whiteboard. Um, you can use there are these different ones on them that, that are free apps now, like Miro or Jamboard or something. And, um, you know, you can sketch your ideas. So in that book, it's all about how we can sketch little things like that to make ideas memorable. And then to apply them, we could use those symbols to explain a project, a process. And the other key thing, AJ, is when people sketch an idea live, live, people remember it more than if the picture's up there in the first place. So one of the things that I do often with children, because I'm a former teacher anyway, but I've been into school since, is I will take some information that's written and turn it into a mind map. Are you familiar with mind maps? Um, Tony Buzan, who, who uh, was, you know, popularized mind maps and coined that term. And one of the reasons why they work so well is, is they represent how the brain works in terms of radiant thinking, because they start in the middle and they go outwards. Yeah? Um, and I will draw a mind map live and then hide it and get the children to work in twos and try and remember it, try and recreate it. And what you find is that the brain is very good at remembering spatially where things are on the page. So once you draw something on a mind map, if you drew up here the, you know, the, the sun is up there. Okay. And down here, we've got something else. So we might have, uh... can you see that? Fish, yeah. The fish is down there. This is just one little example. But if in science you were drawing all about nutrition and you've got the different vitamins written over here like this, vitamin A, B, C, D, yeah, okay. The brain is very good at, at remembering that the fish was down here and the sun was up there. So. Again, it, it's really quick sketches uh, really fit well with the brain. And when the children do them themselves or students, it works really well. Yeah, I think that, uh, the spatial thinking is really important because there, were, there, were, there are some techniques when if you have to memorize something, you put that something into some place in the room where you're talking. So yes. That corner, I have my first section of the speech in another corner, the last, for example. That's a very powerful technique. I think the Romans used to do that, didn't they? <laughs> so I don't know about that. They, they, yeah, I heard that the Ro some of the Roman orators, when they were doing their speeches, mm. they would look at the crowd and they would have one part of it over on a building there, and then another part of it on the building behind, and then on another building over here. They would imagine that's where the key uh, trigger or the key word was. Yeah. Mm. So that's the location method. Works really well. Yeah. And uh, you touched upon this virtual whiteboards, right, in today's meetings like in business meetings you are all on zoom yes and when i when i want to draw something online it doesn't really happen as i mean the technology is so much advanced but it is still not as good as writing with your hand on hand yeah paper what are the tips that you can give if somebody has to really use uh, the electronic medium to do the drawing and showing it to somebody what tools do people use? And well, you, yes, I mean, you could still do it. If you've got an, an, I've got an iPad here, I've taken it upstairs now, but yeah, if you've got something like an iPad or 
some sort of tablet. And when you're doing it, if you um, use color, it's a great one. The brain loves color. Um, if you um, plan it in advance so that you know things will fit, <laughs> because I've run out of space sometimes. <laughs> um, if you plan it in advance, if you try and make it go with the words that you're saying, uh, create curiosity, perhaps ask questions. So it's not all about telling, you know, you could, you could be explaining something and say to a group, okay, I'm going to draw vitamin C here. What do you think I might be drawing? Most people will say you might draw an orange, you know, so getting people guessing is another one. Okay. What's the point you were making that there's sometimes a delay between the drawing and when the picture comes up? Is that a point you made there or not? No? No. No, there is no. When I've done it, the picture seems to come up straight away. So I would say don't overuse it, but if you've got something to explain, plan it first and keep it simple. So a mind map with four or five arms on it would be good, a simple little process. But why it works so well, AJ, is people love to watch a picture develop because they don't know what it's going to be. So for example, if I drew, so the live drawing, if I drew on here, here we go, can you see this? Yes, yes, yes. So if I drew this, Okay, and then I drew this. Now people are wondering what this is going to be. You might recognize a famous person as I draw it. Yeah, Einstein. Albert Einstein. Okay, and uh, he was great for coming up with fantastic ideas. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when, people's, when people see a drawing emerge, it hooks attention. And people might think, well, that's all very well for him because I can't draw Einstein, although actually you could. If you could draw, if you could draw Spike, you could draw him. Um, it doesn't matter what you draw. You could be explaining something on a whiteboard to a group of colleagues, and you could simply start off by drawing a circle. And they're already hooked because they're wondering why you've drawn that. And they're wondering what's going to come next. And you draw two lines like that, and they're thinking, well, why has he drawn that? Okay, so it's not about, the drawing has to be sort of good enough, but you don't have to be fantastic at drawing. And in that book, The Art of Business Communication, what I would, my main point was most things you would want to draw can be a simple shape. So the mountain can be a triangle. Mm. The tree can be a cloud sort of shape, mm. yeah? If you want to draw, uh, for example, a, a bus, here we go. Down the bottom, can you see? A rectangle. Okay, not the best bus you've ever seen, but you know, it will do. Um, and the other tip I'd give to people when you want to remember something, sometimes people say a picture's worth a thousand words. But my tip is to draw the picture and the word next to it. Okay, in fact, I was fortunate enough to speak, uh, he's unfortunately died now, but to speak at an event with Tony Buzan and I did, I did a mind map there, and he said to me, a big tip was to put the word very near the picture, because then people get the word and the picture yeah. at the same time. Okay, so in, in your next book, which is about the speaker's coach, I believe yes. you, I mean, I've, I've, I'm waiting to read that, I've not yet read it, but is it also about how do you use sketching to the 60 secrets, how many of 60, how many of those are actually related to sketching and okay so yes it's called the, the the main title is the speaker's coach obviously and the subtitle so the fans blowing my papers about here the subtitle is 60 secrets to make your talk speech or presentation amazing okay so how many of those are to do with sketching there are a few in there actually i've put some special bits in there that are also in the first book um so i've probably put about um three or four in there and giving tips on how to sketch. Um, but most of them are tips about speaking that don't necessarily involve sketching at all, don't involve sketching at all. So they'd be things like, um, how do you plan a talk? How do you get people on board? Um, how do you hook attention? How do you structure a talk for maximum impact? Um, how do you appeal to many different people? You know, sometimes people say, how do you pitch a talk when you've got a lot of different people in the room? Um, who are interested in different things. 
um, or how do you how do you stand? How do you move? How do you sit? You know, sh should you sit like this or, um, or or should you sit upright? You know, where do you look in a room? What to do with your hands? So it's full, really, of a lot of the tips that I've learned over many years that make the difference. And the big thing that I tried to do with the book, it does have a lot of cartoons in it, in fact. Um, it's got, it's got, probably got about 80 cartoons in it. Um, so we've got, just to illustrate the, the points, I'm just, I've just grabbed it now since you mentioned it. Um, so, for example, every, every tip, there's a cartoon on there, look, can you see? Yeah. So they're all looking at him. Mm. And uh, what's he saying? There's a little caption. Oh, he's saying, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's saying, I'm so excited to be here today. Here he is, look. But he doesn't look, but he doesn't look very excited, does he? No. Does so he? so that, that, tip is, that, that tip is all about how, um, that tip is all about how if you want to, generate some excitement you need to be excited yourself you know so yeah. in, in, ev in every tip i've um i've actually drawn a picture mm -hmm. um sometimes more than one picture but it's not really um it's not really it's not about particularly how to how to learn to draw except three or four secrets do cover that as well but the other books more about that okay <laughs> great, great um so, so traditionally we learn from text by reading right I mean, the academic books are actually called textbooks. Yes. Not many people like to read textbooks because they are actually boring. There's a lot of text written in them and in a, in a very small font. I was wondering if it is possible or if you have thought about using the cartoons to, to you know, to convey the ideas in the, in the academic subjects such as physics, chemistry, statistics, for example. Yes, I'm, I mean, to be fair, in, in a lot of books, you do find a lot of really good diagrams. Um, so, you know, they don't have to be cartoons. Where you get lovely, colourful diagrams, perhaps of the heart or whatever it is, um, you know, they work really, really well. So there is a lot of good, there are a lot of good examples out there for children and students of books that have a lot of colour and a lot of pictures in. So I think, to be fair, there's a, there's a fair bit happening there. And also, not everything has to be turned into a cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, th th that, that I would say. Um, but I think there pro probably is more, more scope um, for helping people to remember by demonstrating how a, a simple picture, it might be a cartoon or a simple symbol, could make something memorable. And also, the thing I would go for is encouraging children to not just read the books, but also to use sketching when they're trying to remember things. Um, and one of the, I'll give you a little example here. Um, in fact, one of the things I've demonstrated before is how on, on one of the DVDs I've got, I demonstrate, um, and there's more, more information on the website, I demonstrate how people can, um, can use sketches to remember ideas. So textbooks are full of pictures, but at the same time, if you were learning something, so say, let's say you were learning the functions of the blood, okay, um, and you want to remember what's the purpose of a red blood cell, okay, so you might read that, okay. What you could do is think, okay, what could I draw that would help me to remember that? And it doesn't matter if it's, it, it's not very complicated. So for example, we've got here, um, if I draw a circle in red, we could say that's a red blood cell. Okay, we could make him into a little um, character. Do you see? There he is. So he's a red blood cell. We could um, draw a couple of feet on him. There he is. Okay. And then we could think, What's his purpose? Okay, so now I draw a little hand there and um, a little hand on this side. And in his hand, I'm going to draw something. What I'm going to draw is a bucket there. Do you see that bucket? Yeah. So there's a, he's got a bucket. And on this hand, he's got, he's got another bucket. Okay. And on the side of the bucket, it says O2. 
Yes. And he, there's some signposts near him. And on this signpost, and there we are, it says legs. And on this signpost over here, it says arms. Do you see that? Yes. Yeah. So that, that reminds us that one of the jobs of the red blood cell is to carry oxygen to all parts of the body. Do you get the idea? Yeah. Right? yeah. So I would contest that once you've drawn that and seen it, you will probably remember that because when you're trying to remember what red blood cells to do, what are you going to picture in your mind? This little yeah. character carrying these buckets with oxygen in. Okay, so now we've trans translated something that might be written into a little picture. Mm -hmm. So even if you've got lots of pictures in, in textbooks, which you, you do have many very good pictures in there, you know, formal diagrams, still the cartoon when you're learning uh, can help you by just sketching something quickly. So there's an idea. So that's one of the things that when I've been in schools, I encourage children to translate information into little sketches for themselves. And it doesn't have to be a very complicated sketch. So I think it, it works really well when, when we are giving the, you know, the basic concepts about an idea. But when you're getting into the details, um, I'm just thinking, what should be the, or what could be the right proportion of having text and pictures? Because these kind of pictures, if if I have it in the university textbooks, for example, have you ever? Because I've never seen uh, most of the university textbooks are pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you have you used this kind of technique in the uh, higher studies books? Well, well I, I've I've used. Um, excuse me, I was just looking for the note I had there. Um, in, 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 in higher studies books, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know is the short answer quite what they, what they do or what you refer to as higher studies books. Do you mean um, college books, that sort of thing? Or? Yeah, I mean, explaining optics, for example, in physics or quantum physics, something like that. Optics or something like that. Yeah, I mean, you do, you do see the good you know, diagrams. I think actually from, from being at school myself, I know physics books and things, they had diagrams in which were good to explain all sorts of things. My tip would be for students to be actually also doing a bit of sketching themselves to remember. Mm. And sometimes when, I, when I'm in schools or even in a business doing this, people will say, oh, when I got my degree, I did a mind map of all the different information, you know, to remember. Um, so the other thing I would say is that whilst pictures are important, we can learn so much by reading anyway. You know, I don't think we should undervalue this idea of the, the written word, because if you're very interested and very absorbed, like in a story or something, you can remember a lot of detail. So I think it's about getting the balance right, AJ, uh, and not to say everything must be a picture, actually. And we can learn a lot through audio books, you know, where we make the pictures in our minds. Um, so, you know... But, uh, but my main point is that if we, if we don't draw anything at all, I think we are missing a trick in terms of memory. If you're trying to remember something and you never, you only ever write words, but never sketch little pictures, we're, we're probably missing a, a trick, I think. Yeah, and I think uh, you touched upon a very important point that uh, we do read, but we create pictures in our brain. And I can recall, I studied, uh, we're talking about optics, so, that there is something called reflection and there is something called refraction. And I do remember the difference only by imagining the pictures that I saw. How from a prism, the light comes in from here and then how does it refract versus how does it reflect? So I remember it from the pictures, but I, I can't tell you what is the exact definition of reflection and refraction. Yeah, but well, that's true. Was, yeah, so we do, we do make pictures in our heads, you know, so we mustn't underplay in, in, in a quest to say everybody must be, you know, doing drawing is a great idea. Mm. We mustn't underplay the value of simply sitting and quietly reading. Um, but of course, there are other techniques when we want to remember things when we're reading. We could be underlining things because we're doing things. We could be highlighting things, marking the book. Um, we could be um, making some notes at the side. It, by making it active, we particularly for study rather than just reading for pleasure. Yeah, it's a matter of learning how to use what you have learned. Mm. And 
you've given a very good demonstration to that because when I was uh, studying uh, the art class, the painting class, for example, yes, they will just teach you how to do the painting, but they will not never teach you that in what ways you can use this. Yeah, because you're you're not a painter, right? No. But you but you produce so much value out of drawing sketches. So <laughs> nobody, nobody teaches these kind of things how you can use the skills. Well, I think it's an underused skill, even in presenting. That's why in, in my book, The Speaker's Coach, I still included some, some um, pages about sketching an idea on a flip chart because it will grab attention. Um, you know, it, 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 does really, it does really help a lot. So, Yeah, so I think I, there should be more emphasis on, uh, in, in schools to the application of the skill that they're teaching. Um, That's right. Yes. And by the time you get, incidentally, when I've been into schools, um, by, by the time I get to speak to 15 and 16 year olds, if I stand in front of a group, a class of 15 and 16 year olds and say, hey, I've got a great idea. Um, actually, we remember a lot more when we draw. And then I say to them, but what's the only problem with that? And even though they're only 15, they say, I can't draw. But if you ask, if you go into a group of six and seven year olds or eight year olds and you talk about them drawing something, they just go, oh yeah, well, you know, yeah, what should we draw? They, they don't even think, they just get on with it. So by the time they get to 15 and 16, for some reason, they're all saying they can't draw. Yeah. So with that, I would ask you this common question that I ask most of my guests to, what are the key skills that you believe are required in order to grow and be successful in life, but those are not taught in schools. There are a few. I've just jotted down several things, um, AJ, because you you you, um, you mentioned to me at the, just before we started that you might ask me this. Um, I actually think that that one of the one of the things that would be really good to teach is 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 confidence. And what I mean by teaching, people might say, well, that's no good. You can't teach confidence, you know. Yeah. But I think one of the things that would be really helpful is to help children understand that they can affect how they feel. They can affect how they feel. So when they're feeling upset or uh, when, they're not feel when they're feeling nervous. So um, an example would be, you know, when we, when we sit up straight, we feel more confident. Okay, or when we're feeling, sometimes if I'm feeling a bit sorry for myself, I might be sitting with my head down, okay. There's a famous cartoon um, that, of Charlie Brown, okay, that illustrates this point. Um, when in the first picture, do you know Charlie Brown Peanuts, yeah? Um, the cartoon. And in the first picture, he's sitting with, he's standing with his head down. And he said, when you're feeling a bit depressed, it makes a lot of difference how you stand. And then in the second picture, he still got his head down. He said, um, he, he, you know, if, if you keep your head down or something, you keep feeling really depressed. And then he said, if you, if you sit up, you start to feel a bit better. Okay, and then in the, in the fourth picture, he's got his head back down again. And he says, if you want to get the most out of feeling depressed, you really need to keep your head down. Okay, in other words, if you keep looking down and keep having the physiology of feeling bad, you'll continue to feel bad. Now, I'm not saying some people don't genuinely feel depressed, but what I'm saying is the quickest way to change how you feel is to change your physiology. So learning things like confidence or, uh, and other techniques like how children could imagine success in their minds so, and what they say to themselves. So many children say, oh, I'm not very good at this. I can't do this. He's better than me. I'll never be able to learn this. So we've got pictures that we make in our mind of us failing and not doing well. We're talking to ourselves all the time with an internal dialogue. And sometimes we're sitting, our physiology is, is in a way that's not helpful for us. So number one, confidence. So that was slightly long explanation. Um, the second one I, I would say would be speaking skills, but I'm biased, okay, because I like teaching speaking skills. But and I, but I reckon that the sort of things I'm teaching to managers in businesses when they're 20, 30, 40, and 50, I think I wish they could have learned those at school. And I think for children, if they could learn some techniques for standing up and giving a good talk, presenting their project, that kind of thing, it would give them confidence. 
um, in themselves as well. So it links to my first one of confidence. And they would also learn how to communicate their idea then. Because to get on in life, we have to get good at communicating with people. You could be the cleverest scientist, but if you can't communicate your idea well to other scientists, you're probably not going to be that successful. Thirdly, my third one, of course, totally biased, would be um, tips on how to rem remember. And of course, schools, many schools do quite a lot of this, but I would say tips on how to remember by drawing, because that's a very niche one that I'm interested in. And I think that's something that schools could do more of. They do quite a lot often of how to remember, um, you know, through various techniques, but I think the drawing could be one. So it's, it's confidence, um, speaking skills, and drawing to remember. I think the, the, the first one is quite interesting, the confidence, and then you spoke about the posing, right? And there's a very popular TED talk by Amy Perry talking about the power posing. You know, That's right, yes. Fake it until you can make it. Fake it till you make it. Yeah, it makes a difference how you stand. When I coach people to speak, and um, before yeah. they get up to speak, I say, stand up straight, you know. Or if you're waiting your turn to speak, instead of sitting like this, if you know you're going to be asked to speak in the next two minutes, and you're waiting in the audience, you might want to be sitting up like this and perhaps doing a little bit of deep breathing to bring yourself into the present moment. Because when we're worried, we're worried about what happened before or what's going to happen next. Yeah. But sitting up straight with the breath, those of you, and perhaps you do meditation, really brings us into the present moment, you know. Yeah. So, and then we can perform better. So these are the things that I think would be good for children to be able to learn. Yeah. yeah. I actually did um, have uh, a guest who is a body language expert, and he said, that when you're sitting like this, your the, the voice, the tone of the voice and the frequency that you're producing are actually different versus when you're sitting like this. There and you it, are. it happens unintentionally. Right. Oh, well, how interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. And you mentioned about speaking and you being biased, actually not, because speaking has come out of the top skill. And most of the people say that even if they are not from speaking industry, they still say that speaking is not a skill that you know everybody should have. So I totally agree with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and third one, and I, the how to remember stuff, right? And I'm now relating what I learned today from you and what I learned from David Allen, which is uh, about getting things done, writing everything down. So what he says is that your mind is to have ideas not hold them ah. when you get the idea you just write it down now i'm thinking yeah i get the idea write it down but draw it down i would rather say draw it down yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that'll that'll keep it in memory also and and then yeah you will be able to remember and then it's out of your head so that's great thank you very much for sharing them so graham you've done one of the most uh, watched tedx speech you have written two best-selling books what is your future plans now what next well um well i'm doing it sort of a bit more of the same really in in that i'm <laughs> i'm currently what i'm doing is i'm obviously promoting the books especially the one that came out last year so sometimes i'm doing articles those sorts of things for them or interviews that kind of thing but also um i'm uh speaking currently i still coach people to speak but virtually now because of the, the, the problem we've had with the COVID, uh, the coronavirus. Um, and, but I still do conferences. So I do, for example, uh, recently I've done many uh, or several um, one hour talks where I sketch ideas and, and people, there might be 50 or 70 people at the other side, are usually business people, but just could be anybody really, um, where I'm, I'm with my flip chart uh, in my office uh, on Zoom or something like that. Um, so more of it is, is going that way. Uh, and the speaking skills I still do with small groups uh, on Zoom and I can record them and play it back and with a little group of say five or four or five people uh, works very nicely. So those are the sorts of things I, I'm doing. And uh, I'll probably be making some more uh, video tips to go online, which I haven't done for a while. Um, and, um, and it's also just nice to, um, to get um, messages from people and write back to them when they've seen one of the, the, the talks, the TEDx Hull talk or the TEDx Vienna talk. I really enjoy that. Um, yeah, and um, you know, just carrying on spreading the message, really. 
So. Okay. Right. So finally, how can people reach you? Well, they can contact me at um, Graham, G-R-A-H-A-M, at visionlearning.co.uk. And um, they can find me on the website if they put in, in into Google. Um, they'll find uh, the website um, grahamshaw.co.uk. Or even if they put visionlearning.co.uk in, it will get to the same place. So, um, so yeah, and they could, they, could, they could Google and find me, I guess. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. I'll put all of those links in the description on my video when it goes live, Graham. Uh, it was a great talking to you and I really learned a lot in uh, the science and the art of drawing and passing your conveying your message. Thank you very much for the nice tips. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. And uh, AJ, it's a pleasure to be invited and uh, I'm delighted to sort of virtually meet all the people who, uh, who may well watch this and, and hopefully they pick up one or two tips. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, guys, if you're looking to know how good of an artist you are, then please do watch Graham's TEDx speech, uh, TEDx Hull, uh, the one with 33 million views. Uh, there is a reason to why th there are so many people watching it. Because once you watch it, you will become a cartoonist. Uh, I'm almost sure about it because I could draw something just by looking at one of his video. I could actually draw that uh, character that he, that he talks about. So definitely go check him. And there's a lot of information he has put on internet. So I'll put all the links, but please do watch it. And thank you for your time. If you have still not done so, then please do consider subscribing to this channel by hitting the subscribe button. And don't forget to hit the bell icon so that you get notification to all my future videos. I will see you again. Thank you very much.